Tim is a Bible teacher, you know, okay, it cost me 20 bucks. Uh, no, <laughs> no, it didn't really. Uh, but he is an amazing young man that you see the hand of God on. And it's interesting that his mother believed before he did. Isn't it good that you have someone in your household? I'm going to throw out a word because it's going to become so important here in chapter 10. Somebody needs to be the remnant in your house that passes on the faith and the belief of God to each person that they come in contact with. Now, my mom became that remnant uh, to our household. But where did my mom get it? Her mother was an atheist the whole time that I knew her until right at the end. My sister told me that she led her to Jesus before she died at 88 years of age. And I'll be honest with you, she was such a mean-spirited woman. I all of a sudden said, if granny's going to be in heaven, heaven doesn't sound as good anymore. <laughs> that was my initial reaction, you know. And I thought, oh, Lord, forgive me, you know. I, I don't want anybody to perish and, and that. But my initial reaction was, she's giving me hell on earth most of my life, you know. And, and now she, Mary Beth tells me she led her to Jesus. And I thought, well, I, I was on the plane get, trying to get back there before she passed away to, and praying about doing the same thing. But when I heard Mary Beth already did it, I was like, and she'd passed away actually as I was driving from the airport to my grandmother's house. My grandmother passed away and Mary Beth was crying. She made it to heaven. I'm going, really? How did that happen? You know, kind of stuff. But the remnant didn't get to my mom from her mom is what I'm telling you. So where did the remnant come from? It was my mom's grandma, her dad's mom. Little four foot nine Hungarian woman. You don't hear me talk about the Hungarian side that much. That's why uh, for my birthday dinner, I had uh, pigs in a blanket, which is stuffed cabbage with its uh, sausage and meat, uh, hamburger meat and rice and mushrooms and different sauces and rolled in a cabbage roll. So uh, we called it pigs in a blanket growing up. Uh, you probably have pancakes and sausage as pigs in a blanket for you, but that's because you weren't being raised Hungarian. All right, so that was our pigs in a blanket. My night mama, that's what we called our great grandma, night mama. She knew no English. She died when I was 10, so I didn't really get to know her that long. But we called her the Hungarian kissing bug because she grabbed us all our, as we came in, all eight of us, that she'd grab us and, and she'd just go right down the line. We'd be like, night mama, stop it, stop it, you know, and she would just, she would rattle stuff at us in Hungarian, whatever, goulash, whatever. <laughs> no, that's not their language. I don't know what their language is. Sorry, goulash is a different Hungarian meal. Uh, all right. But that was the remnant that got to my mom that would get to me and to my brothers and sisters. The remnant's important. When we look at Isaiah, there's themes throughout it, so different ones. Tonight I picked the theme of judgment for the beginning of the unique parts of it. And judgment is a key element in, in Isaiah. It's a very key element, especially in the first 39 chapters that are like the Old Testament. Remember, it's the Bible within the Bible. The first 39 is like the Old Testament, a lot of judgment. And the last 27 is a lot of grace and mercy. And, but just like we see grace and mercy tucked in the Old Testament, it's there in the first 39 chapters of Isaiah also. But judgment is a key element to the book of Isaiah. Now, three more things I'm going to tell you about this in the that you'll, that you'll learn and it's being unfolded and some of it's being unfolded tonight and some in the future's parts of it on judgment. Judgment because of transgressions. Judgment just doesn't come out of clear blue sky like God says, I just wanna bring judgment. There's a reason behind it. The transgressions have gotten so great that God says, remember last week, uh, the phrase that, that, that we had over and over and over in verse, uh, in chapter 9, and it ended in verse 4 because we were going to start in verse 5. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. All right, that came four times. That's because of the transgressions. Now, the next one is judgment because they changed the law. Yeah. The Jewish ones in the north and all the rest, they changed the ordinances, is one of the translations. They changed the ordinances. They changed the law. They changed it to pervert it for themselves. 
Remember, this is one of the reasons why they're going to go in captivity for all those years, because they weren't obeying the Shemitah. They weren't giving people the break after six years and, and setting off the debts. They were changing the ordinances, the law, to, to be something that they could take advantage of. You know, so it's kind of like they were changing the tax codes of the law that God wanted society to work by in uh, debt. And they, they were changing the law in so many different areas. And, and you'll see that as we go through the book of Isaiah. And the last one is judgment because they broke covenant. Judgment came because they broke covenant. And you'll see that somewhere here Isaiah brings this constant theme across that the judgment, if he doesn't bring judgment when covenant is broken, many times people won't know that the covenant's on. They go, God's still good with us. God won't do this with us. When several weeks ago when we taught on the fear of the Lord, you know, we said most of our kids that maybe aren't serving him or whatever else, they're still say, I love God and God loves me, but they don't, they're not in covenant. They don't fear the Lord. Okay, so you see, this all plays in as part of one of the major themes. There's many themes in the book of Isaiah, and I've been trying to bring you unique things about it, but this is one of the things in it. All right, fun names tonight. I, I'd listen to several people do. I've, I got my, my way of saying these names tonight, and we're just going to live with them. All right, starting in verse 5. Woe to the Assyrians. Notice I have this in, in yellow. The rod of my anger. Remember? Verse 4 was, yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. Who's the rod of his anger? The Assyrians are the rod of his anger. In whose hand is the club of my wrath? I send him against a godless nation. I dispatch him against a people who anger me. To seize a loot and snatch plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. Not sounding too good, is it? Verse 7, but this is not what he intends. This is not what he has in mind. His purpose is to destroy, to put an end to many nations. Are not the commanders all kings? He says, has not Kalno fared with Kar Karshemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad and Samaria like Damascus? As my hand sees the kingdoms of the idols, kingdoms whose images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria. All right. When he ends there with Jerusalem and Samaria, if, you, if, if you're just finding us online, what he's doing, he's talking about Jerusalem is the southern part of the kingdom of Israel, and Samaria actually, he calls it sometimes Ephraim, the kingdom of the north. He sometimes just calls it as the house of Israel. That's the northern kingdom where the, the ten tribes went up there to do idols. Uh, but a remnant has made its way back down to Jerusalem. All right important part of that. Let's look at this. He says the Assyrians are the rod of his anger. Let's talk about God's vessels. This is a very important thread that if we had time, we could spend a week or two just studying this part of it. I'm going to show you the, the, you know these six, but let's go through. Here's the six vessels God has used to impact who Israel will be today. First was the Egypt or the Egyptians. Remember, captivity. Second, we're hearing about them here tonight, the Assyrians. Do you know who's third? Babylonians, okay, or Babylon, yeah, Babylonians. Who comes in and takes over the Babylonians? But the Babylonians are the ones that actually cart, they're the ones that do the destruction of Jerusalem. It's not to that to this point that Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed when the Babylonians come and they cart Daniel and all of them. Daniel is a young 17-year-old out and comes in King Cyrus, the Medes and Persians. Empire comes next. And what happens? He sends back. You got to read Daniel all over now since we're going to talk about this in this. You go back to read this part. He sends a remnant back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Then the, the next group is the, the Greece empire. Greece is the word. I said that for a reason. What did, he, what did Greece do? Changed all the word, didn't it? 
the Greek language became the world language. Greece is the word. Isn't that interesting, the little play on that? I know you thought I was thinking about John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John and the, and the thing Greece. No, the Greece empire changed the word. And it changes our Old Testament from the Hebrew to the Septuagint, which is in Greek, you know, and the New Testament, in, it, amazing. It's a pure language, folks. God used it, but it changes Israel and it changes the Old Testament to the Septuagint, very important role. And then the sixth kingdom that comes and, and uh, has dominion over Israel is Rome. All right. Now, these are God's vessels. Tonight we're hearing Isaiah say, the vessel is Assyria. The Assyrians are the vessel in this. So that's, you know, nation number two. There's six nations. Now, a very cool thing about this, if you go out into Revelation, there's going to be a thing about the Antichrist, and it's going to say something along this line. There are five kings. There's one coming, who will remain for a short time, but it won't be him, and then the seventh king, or kingdom, he will be the eighth king of the world. He belongs to the seven. Right through here, we have the six kingdoms. What would be the seventh kingdom before? Well, it's in the sixth kingdom, Rome does the dispersion of all the Jews. Very interesting stuff here. What I'm saying to you is if you want to study this, you can start getting a key of that somewhere in our past, the Antichrist spirit is coming up from. I don't know how many knew this or not, but ISIS is from the Assyrian Empire. That's their background. They're Assyrians. How interesting. They already once whooped on people. As you go through this, you're going, wow, it's like, ooh, where did these all come from? Very interesting part as you see that who's using them as a vessel? God is. It doesn't mean he made them this way, but he does use them as a vessel. He used Egypt as a vessel and actually told that uh, they would be in captivity for 400 years, right? And the devil knew he had 400 years before Moses would get him out of captivity and 400 years to put booby traps in the promised land. You never want to tell the devil what you're doing, but God works it all together. All right, that's enough on that because I, I could have a whole lot of fun with that, and you guys would be going, I didn't really get what all that was about. The Assyrians are a vessel. All these nations have been a vessel to do what? To hone and work something in the lives of God's people. All right, just a footnote there. We're picking it up in verse 10. As my hand sees the kingdoms of the idols... Kingdoms whose images excelled, oh, I, I, I read that earlier, but I've been going back to it. Those in, of Jerusalem and Samaria. Shall I not deal with Jerusalem and her images as I dealt with Samaria and her idols? Now, he's asking a question here. I'm going to pause during this section and, and share some things with you because we've got nine verses we're going to look at here. He's saying judgment's already coming. There's a breach that already happened. That was in chapter 9 in the northern kingdom. Remember, the bricks have fallen and all the rest. The northern kingdom has already had a breach that's taken place. He's saying, should I let this happen also to Jerusalem? We know, because you know history, Jerusalem doesn't fall until the next Nash, uh, to the Babylonians. All right. So the Assyrians don't get to capture. God gave a promise. You've got to go all the way back to chapter 5 of Isaiah where he promised and said, this is not going to happen to, to Jerusalem. It happens to the southern part of the kingdom, to the Judea part of it, but Jerusalem never falls on the Assyrians. All right. Just keep the history part of it. So the south feels it. They get really close, but they don't get to get into Jerusalem. And watch, he even brings out the pass here. All right. Verse 12. When the Lord has finished all his work against Mount Zion and Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes. Now remember, the Syrians are just a tool, but the Assyrians with pride and haughtiness says, look what we're doing to 
these people because the reputation of God's people had gotten around. All the other people knew that these people have a God that seems to be very, very mighty. They knew what took place uh, in Egypt and all the history things and stuff. The, the stories were out there that these are people that have a mighty God and, and look what they're doing. And the Assyrian king gets prideful. It seems like pride doesn't really work well for anybody, does it? All right, just a little footnote. That's why I put that in yellow there. Pride in his heart is going to get this guy in trouble. Sorry, in verse 13. For he says... By the strength of my hand, I have done this. By my wisdom, because I have understanding, I removed the boundaries of nations. I plundered their treasures. Like mighty one, I subdued their kings. Now, as one reaches into a nest, so my hand reaches for the wealth of the nations. As a people gather abandoned eggs, so I have gathered all the countries. Not one flapped a wing or opened its mouth to chirp. Now, this is God speaking. I wish, I wish when God's speaking in, on his behalf, when that, I wish they would put it in red like Jesus did in that. Because verse 15, this is God saying this. Does the ax raise itself above the person who swings it? Or the saw boast against the one who uses it? As if a rod were to yield the person who lifts it up. Or a club, bradish, bradish the one who is not wood. Hmm. Therefore, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will send a wasting disease upon his sturdy warriors. Under his pomp of fire will he be kindled like a blazing flame. Key verse right here, verse 17. Watch, I have it in, in yellow up there. The light of Israel. Anybody want to guess who that is? Who's the light of Israel? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. The light of Israel will become a fire, their holy one a flame. In a single day it will burn and consume his thorns and his briars. The splendor of his forests and uh, fertile fields, it will completely destroy as when a sick person wastes away. And the remaining trees of his forest will be so few that a child could write them down. All right. So few. <laughs> Just indigestion from, uh, from dinner or whatever, I don't know. All right. In this part, I wanted to just give you a little thing. Again, if you have a cross-reference study Bible, you can have a lot of fun with this. I'm going to give you a little taste of this. I, I shared with you that there's going to be so many different names for Jerusalem, so many different names for Jesus, titles of God in prophecy. I didn't put any of the ones in that we've already covered, you know, where it calls him Emmanuel. We know that from chapter 7, right? And we know that again that he says it in chapter 9, Emmanuel, God with us, that's Jesus. I wanted to pick this title here in verse 17, the light of Israel. The light of Israel, and it puts a connection with John chapter 1, and I put the verses there for you, 4, 5, and 9, and his first coming. The light of the world. It's shown in the darkness. That's what John the Apostle is writing about there. But his second coming also ties into this. That's what I love about Isaiah's writing, and, and because it's such a long book, 66 chapters, how this happens over and over again, where he does something, and he gives us this title, The Light of Israel, and it is there in John for Jesus' first coming. You know, the, the light came into the world, and Jesus is that light. We know that, and all that from John 1. But in Revelation chapter 22, there's a little verse that says, and there will be no more darkness. There'll be no more darkness because there's a light of Israel and the light of the church that lights up all eternity. And it's found there in Revelation chapter 22 that ties all the way back here to this title of the light of Israel. And so I thought that was so cool that he throws out something that you can follow along and go, here it is in, in his first coming, and here it is that that will be his title in eternity because we have no need for the sun and no need, there won't be any darkness because Jesus is the light. 
pretty cool. And so just a little touch of how tucked in, how many times have we already in just these 10 chapters seen that tucked in where it's something for that day. He was he was proclaiming a hope for those that would be what we're going to call the remnant here in a moment, that there's a light of Israel and that's a future hope that 700 years in the future, Jesus, and it's our future hope there in heaven that he's going to be the light of eternity. So just a cool little thing. All right, we're going to do 20 through 23 in this segment right here. This is the remnant segment. In that day, the remnant of Israel the survivors of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. I love it. I mean, we just got done with who's the Holy One of Israel. It's the same as the light. This is Jesus on every page, you know, in the Old Testament. So cool. And so many verses where he keeps coming back to that. A remnant will return a remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty will return to the mighty God though your people be like the sands of the sea Israel only a remnant will return destruction has been decreed overwhelmingly and righteous hmm all right this i again i'm just touching the surface of this You could go through so many different stories, but I thought I'd pick some that are very familiar with you and give you the remnant aspect. If God is the same yesterday, today, and out there, is there always a remnant? I think so. Every household, I think if you you could sit down, even with the most wickedest, wickedest, meanest homes, I bet there's still a remnant somewhere in there that God was trying, that none should perish. There's a remnant somewhere, and they chose to either denounce their remnant or or what you know and you go well, wait a minute there's a lot of villages and people i know that that I, i'm i'm using a very preaching term there that all of them will be judged under a different part of it but within our society today those that say we know the christian entity has touched the world i believe there's remnants in in every home in every way and how does that work i don't know it's bigger than i can understand But let me take you on the journey of the remnant and see if you start seeing how God is able to understand that he can put a remnant wherever he needs to. Genesis 6, the remnant was eight people. Out of the whole world population, there was only a remnant of eight. Noah and his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. The remnant was only eight in the ark. I love it, that part of it, as, as we've been having the Chinese students, if, I, if, you have, if you've heard this before, uh, it's really cool, but if you haven't, the historical symbol language of the Chinese, they have a symbol for, for this, and I've, I've sent the clip to you guys, for, to many of you that asked for it, and if you text me and say, I want the clip, give me your email, I'll send it to you so you can see it, where they have this... Chinese pastor that's speaking to about 5,000 people, and he shows you how that points to Noah in their historical language. It's just really, really cool. But the second remnant is found in Genesis chapter 19. And this remnant is cut down to four. There was eight in chapter uh, six, chapter 19. There's only a remnant of four, and that's out of the city of Sodom. Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. Only four make it out of that. Out of the four, one doesn't make it all the way. Really interesting. But there's a remnant from the city of Sodom. There was still a remnant. I mean, that's why when I throw out the thing, I think there's a remnant everywhere. If the city of Sodom could have a remnant, why couldn't... Why couldn't there be a remnant everywhere? That's, that's my philosophy in that. Is, there, is that true? Can you hold that to me, that, uh, that, that there's a remnant everywhere today? I don't know, but I go, man, if you can find one in Sodom and Gomorrah, I think you can find one anywhere. All right, that's kind of my 
my thought process. How accurate that could be, I don't know. The next remnant that, that I wanted you to see, because it comes back to the story here that we're talking about, Cyrus sending the Jews back, but only a remnant. They, historians say it was probably around 50,000 people left Babylon and went back to rebuild Jerusalem. So we're talking really a remnant of, of a people to go rebuild the nation of Israel and, and Jerusalem and the temple, 50,000 people. That's a remnant. Then moving, I went totally futuristic, as you can see, the end time remnant. And since this remnant all dealt with Israel, I didn't hit our remnant at all as Christians. I stayed just very separate to Israel and the Jewish people. There will be a remnant of 144,000 that will be in the, in the last days that will be the remnant um, to the world and to especially Israel that uh, Jesus is the Messiah. So pretty cool study. Again, I hope I'm, what I'm doing tonight is just wetting your whistle for how to study and look for broader themes within something here. The remnant is mentioned twice here. A remnant will return, a remnant of Jacob, and then it says only a remnant will return. He's actually speaking to the one of number three there when he's speaking this all the way in the future of Cyrus. That's only a remnant will return is what um, most historians believe what he's talking about, which means the Assyrians are doing the trouble here. They'll be captured by Babylon. Babylon will destroy it all, take them off. And then the next ones, the Medes and Persians, that's where only a remnant comes. How interesting in that scripture that we're talking several, you know, civilizations down the road of where that scripture is going to be fulfilled. Pretty cool stuff. All right, the meaning part of chapter 10 here. Oh, such fun reading on this. Here we go. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says. My people who live in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians, who beat you with a rod and lift up a club against you as Egypt did. I love when God gets historical, don't you? He's saying, your ancestors know what this. They got beat by the Egyptians. Now you're getting beat by the Assyrians. The next generation will get beat by the Babylonians. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay, just thought that was interesting. Verse 25. Very soon my anger against you will end. I love to hear that, don't you? And my wrath will be directed towards their destruction. He's talking about the Assyrians. That he, his wrath's going to end towards Jerusalem and it will be towards the Assyrians. The Lord Almighty will lash out, lash them with a whip as when he struck down Midian at the rock of orbit. And he will raise his staff over the waters as he did in Egypt. A second time again saying, the civilization before you, I did this to the Egyptians. I'm going to do this to the Assyrians. They're a rod that I'm using, but there will be judgment that comes against them because they think they're the ones destroying and taking captive nations and all the rest instead of being used by my hand. All right, here we go. Um, verse 27. In that day, their burden will be lifted from your shoulders, their yoke from your neck. The yoke will be broken because you have grown so fat. This is the fun part, the very last year. They entered Aeth, they passed through Migron, they stored supplies in Michmash. <laughs> they go over the pass and say, we will camp overnight at Giba. Rama trembles. Geba of Saul flees. Cry out, daughter of Galim. Listen, Lishi. Poor Anatha. Madame Emma, yeah, is in flight. Oh, Lord, help us. A few more. The people of Gibbon take cover. This day they will halt at Nob. That's important. That's why I have it in yellow. They will shake their fists at the mount of the daughter of Zion at the hill of Jerusalem. See the Lord, the Lord Almighty, with lopped off bow, bow, yeah, yeah, now bows, thank you, 
Man, I was just, I was so worried about those other names, I couldn't even get the easy ones out. With great power, the lofty trees will be felled, the tall ones will be brought low, he will cut down the forest thickets with an axe, Lebanon will fall before the mighty one. All right, what's going on here? If you notice in your notes, I put, it's a countdown to judgment. Each town from the very first one of the Aeth, Aeth is about, 30 miles, point number one. It's 30 miles from Jerusalem. And each city is a systematic countdown of getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. With the stop of it, of the attack of the Assyrians before Jerusalem is overtaken. So every city, it actually, uh, if you go to a commentary, it'll actually say, this one's 30 miles away, this one's 24 miles away, this one's 18 miles away, this one's 16 miles away. And each city is closer. So what Isaiah is saying, you're going to see the countdown to judgment as they're coming from city to city to city, as they're getting to you in Jerusalem. Pretty significant. So from this, there's two things that I think that you need to know. We're, we, we're always learning about God's wrath and, and who he is as a God of justice and everything. The important point of this, judgment with a countdown shows grace. Oh my, they're at that city? Mikmash? Oh, that's, a, that's closer than Migron, closer than Aeth. Oh, he's getting closer. And that, aren't you loving that I'm going to try and say those names? And, and each city is, oh, no, now they're only this many miles away. It's a countdown to get your act together, to, that God is giving you a countdown to see that. Is he consistent in that? Does he do that? Is there, does it seem like he's been given the church a countdown for such a long time that there will be this age and, and it counts down and, and all these different things? I think it shows grace, don't you? The last thing, though, judgment that is sudden shows wrath. Now, they all show, it all shows wrath, but this shows you a different wrath. We've been talking about the wrath of abandonment. We probably have been seeing the wrath of abandonment since 2001 when God removed his protection in your footnotes at the end, if you didn't get this from the past, you should get this tonight. There's the difference between the wrath of judgment and the wrath of abandonment. The wrath of abandonment means he's saying, ah, okay, you guys want to have life without me? I'm now removing my hand from your leadership. You'll get whatever leaders you want. Look at our election. Woo, mercy. Has the wrath of abandonment come to our leadership? possible. The second sign of wrath of abandonment is there no, seems to be no more blessing coming our ways. Does it seem like a long time since as a nation we've been blessed? And the third uh, element of the wrath of abandonment is the lack of protection, where you would say, God protected us from those enemies. God protected us from that situation. God gave us favor and protection in that. Uh, you just see that God is saying, you're on your own. You're on your own. You wanted to have a, a country where I can't be in the schools, where uh, churches don't even acknowledge me most of the time. They want to they acknowledge how to be socially respectable to the world and everything, and you don't worry about my ways and my laws and my things. He goes, you're on your own. So uh, the suddenness shows the wrath of judgment. The wrath of judgment is really shown in the tr the seven trumpets, the, the seven bowls, that's where the wrath of judgment really shows in Revelation in that, that it's sudden and boom, it's coming. Now, in some ways, he did it even as a countdown in that. There's going to be seven of them. It's good, they're going to get, nothing looks better than the thing that was here the time before. You know, it gets worse and worse. So did he tuck in even his wrath of judgment for the end times, that they could go back if they get in the Word go, oh, you think the last thing was bad? What do you see this next bowl? Or what do you see the next thing that's going to take place? And that those that have to live through that can see the hand of God. All right? Um, Isaiah, an amazing book. Uh, this next week, it, it 
gets to the futuristic parts of, of again, Jesus through the branch of Jesse and some really cool insights and stuff that we'll get into next week. Let's pray, and then we'll take the, the question and answers. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you that you give insight and wisdom through your word. And Lord, I've done the best to explain it in so much taking place here. And, and if there was any confusion, I pray that you clear it up in people's minds. They would get in the word and they would see some of the things for themselves. I thank you that you give each of us that responsibility to study ourselves, to show ourselves approved, a person that correctly handles and divides the word of truth. Thank you that your blessing's always on your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's see who's, who's asking.